unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Slay with Tooth First. First Nations. I am here with Abby from Industrial Light and Magic. Abby worked as the VFX supervisor on the film Good Night Oppie. And uh, very simply, if you have not seen Good Night Oppie, I'm very sorry. The mission uh, focus, the film focuses on a mission that's been over for five years. So I think you're going to have to accept things being spoiled. But hello, Abby. How are you today? Hi, um, I'm good. Thanks for having me here. Oh, we are very excited to have you here. Very excited to hear about uh, your work you did on the film. Uh, before we get into the work you did, I guess, uh, how much experience with space and space exploration missions did you have before working on the film? Quite a bit. I actually grew up as a bit of a uh, space nerd, um, always followed um, most of NASA's missions. Also growing up in India, I followed a bunch of India's space missions as well. Um, so yeah, I was definitely clued in, uh, knew about the rovers. So when um, the opportunity, no pun intended, came up, um, I definitely had to jump at this one. Uh, it definitely is a bit of a pet hobby of mine. A pet hobby of yours. No, I, that's great to hear because when we were talking before uh, going live on YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. we were mentioning a bit more about the challenges associated with it and kind of the emotional connection you almost got to some of the projects you've worked on uh, with ILM and how that's gone for, for you. Mm -hmm. But I guess now we can jump in to your part of the presentation and the work you did on Goodnight Oppie, which I watched just last week, and it was very, very beautiful, very awesome and lovely to see. Yeah, it's 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 a fun. Uh, it was a fun project for all of us, and uh, it's very rare to come across shows like Goodnight Oppie, especially with its documentary form, because documentaries usually don't need visual effects, right? So, um, us at ILM being a part of it was definitely a fun experience for us. Um, so I could, you know, share my screen, just run through a bit of a slide, and uh, we could just talk about some of the work we did. Go for it. And for those of you watching on YouTube or Facebook, put your messages in the chat that you may have for Abby and I will ask them as they come up. Sweet. Um, right. Yeah. So like you mentioned, uh, Goodnight Night Oppie chronicles um, NASA's successful launch of the Mars rovers, Opportunity and Spirit in uh, 2003, uh, with Oppie defying expectations and going beyond the 90-day mission and surviving for 15 years. To portray that story, filmmaker Ryan White uh, turned to ILM, in a sense, to produce computer-generated imagery to accompany, uh, to accompany present-day interviews and archival footage. Uh, very early on, Ryan mentioned that E.T. was his favorite film growing up and wanted to bring that emotion into uh, Goodnight Oppie. So the visual effects that we did played an integral role in telling the story of the uh, rover's expedition, contributing to about 34 minutes uh, of the film's 19-minute runtime. So roughly one third of the of the film. Um, and the following slides that I'm going to share are stills from the documentary. Uh, plus, I have some references in here, so we we can chat about that. Awesome. Because I, yeah, wondering with E.T. being the inspiration for it, E.T. is like a living creature, right? Like the alien's mm -hmm. a living creature. And in this case, you know, the emotional connection really ends up being with these robots, which aren't mm -hmm. technically alive. So it was that part of the challenge for you to try to somehow garner an emotional connection or an emotional state of, of the robot? Absolutely. For us, when, when we got into it, we were look, looking at it from a science point of view, right? Like trying to build the rovers as accurate as possible. And when Ryan briefed us about the project, we knew that he wanted to bring this emotional aspect to it. And it was all about the emotional bond that was built between the rovers and the mission engineers as well. Um, so we had to bring that into our visual effects that we that we were creating. And there are a few points that I'll touch upon that will actually expand on how we did some of that work. Um, and to, to start off, like we built um, computer generated models of opportunity and spirit, and they were built to the utmost attention, even to the smallest details that include the actual placement of, of nuts, bolts, wires, decals, um, and the rovers are the most accurate version ever created outside of NASA and JPL uh, to the version and type that was sent to Mars. Through every stage of the build, we worked with the filmmakers and the project engineers to make sure that the team here at ILM were portraying the rovers 
as they were when they were originally sent on their Martian expedition. And uh, to come to your point about the emotional factor in there, um, to keep the storytelling aspect of opportunity and spirit, the team here and the, the filmmakers worked closely to, to build a library of animations that would portray subtle but convincing emotions uh, of the rovers. We wanted to show that they were more than just a box of wires, cameras, and sensors. Um, this was a bit of a creative liberty that we took to form that connection between the rovers and the viewing audience. Um, and in, in an attempt, like I mentioned, to, to match that emotional bond between um, the mission engineers and the Mars rovers, uh, we also needed the rovers to carry the story. And uh, But we owed it to the, to the really incredible team at NASA and JPL, um, and we owed it to them to keep it feeling real and true to the events that actually uh, happened. Um, for example, the, the rovers have these two, two cameras. Um, they look like eyes in their engineering design, right? So... The animators uh, here at ILM used the movement of the camera shutter and the motion of the lens filters um, as eye blinks to, to emote various states of confusion and curiosity. And that was something Ryan, director, um, suggested. And we thought that was a great idea because we could then support that with rotations of the head to show minor frustrations and triumphs while keeping while keeping it within the bounds of the rover's physical limitations and without making it look very cartoony because we definitely didn't want it to go into the Wally -E territory uh, yeah. and make it too Pixar like. Too Pixar like. I remember like reading about you know the film after after I watched it and seeing a lot of like which came first like Opportunity <clears> or <throat> Wally -E, like the attachment to them and I guess mm -hmm. NASA always says like the rovers came first right and there's two right there's Opportunity and there's Spirit That's so right. you had to animate and work with both of these rovers but mm -hmm. they're painted in two very different lights right uh, throughout the film so how did yeah. we, how did you overcome I guess for those who don't know Spirit and Opportunity, launched at the same time or, or close to the same time, arrived to Mars at around the same time. Uh, but Spirit's mission ended much, much earlier than Opportunities did. And it had a lot more, I guess, problematic childlike behaviors almost. Yeah, well, they did label it as the problem, the, the rebellious teenager, right? Uh, yeah. You can, yeah, you can see that in the documentary as well. The rebellious um, teenager. So how did you, I guess, were there any ways you worked with uh, showing that kind of rebellious persona that was attached to spirit and, you know, the lovely golden child that was attached to uh, opportunity. Right. Well, we, th throughout the documentary as well, there, there were subtle cues in there, like the music's different, for one, the sound design's slightly different. Um, and also visually, we always kept sp uh, spirit to the screen right of frame and opportunity to the screen left. Um, so whenever you see a split screen, uh, you see opportunity to the left uh, of screen and then a spirit to the right of screen. And also Spirit's world had a bit of a bluish hue to it, a slight bluish tint, whereas um, Opportunities was uh, more on the red tones to it. Um, and animation-wise as well, there are bits where we see uh, when Spirit, spirit breaks a wheel, um, a bunch of frustrations there, struggles with the rover, um, that we managed to portray through the animation itself. So those were subtle things that we added in there. So it's a bit of a psychological factor when you look at uh, the visuals of the rovers that you, you know and understand that they are, you know, character-wise two different things because their actual physical design are exactly the same. They're the same rovers, but we had to bring in those little uh, emotional and visual cues to them. No, well, from as someone who watched the movie, you did a great job. It worked. It really shows that you know one is definitely the problem and one is mm -hmm. perfect. But uh, what else do you have to show us with what else you worked on? on the yeah, show? so you know the the expanse of the Martian terrain. I mean, it plays such a huge part, right? And it's Mars. Um, it's so recognizable, and recreating the landscape was a challenge. Um, we asked if we could go. They said no. Um, would have been a long journey. Uh, um, would have been too long. Would have been too been long. Been a bit too long. Yeah, <laughs> but I think I, I would yet. have enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, besides scientific imagery, there was no other reference of the surface of Mars. Um, to stay true to science and accurate 
to the Mar to Mars itself, we collaborated closely with NASA to um, to accu accurately recreate the Martian surface like uh, never before. So um, we received a really rich data set uh, from NASA that included tons of elevation data captured by the high-rise orbiter, as well as images captured by the pan cams, nav cams, and has cams on the rovers. Um, the team here at ILM then used this data as a foundation for our CGI environment build. Um, the high-rise images were used as a basis for the topology of landmarks like um, Victoria Crater and Endeavour, while the images from other cameras inform the composition of soil, the type, size, and uh, density of the rocks. So we had a lot of um, imagery that we could really use, but one of the other challenges was that um, a lot of these images had the color filter on it, right? So they had a bunch of filters on them. So we had to interpret that to make it feel a little bit more in line to what it would actually look like in the actual color spectrum. Right, because I guess how, um, I know mainly how, how telescopes take images, right? And for Hubble, that all comes down in black and white and the color filter mm -hmm. is taken, like the the filters put over the telescope as it takes the image in the easiest way to explain it. And then the colors added later by the mm -hmm. by data scientists when they're down there. And so I'm assuming something similar happens with with the rovers like this. And so you have to kind of work backwards to figure out what it would look like more to the human eye. Is that what That's you're right. saying? That's exactly what it is, because um, some of the images were shot with infrared. Um, some some of them were shot in other color spectrums, uh, which just escapes me for, for a second. But uh, we had to then interpret that as, as to something that would look visually pleasing. Also, I think Hollywood has sold the idea of what Mars looks like in a certain move in certain set of movies. So we had to also write that line so that, you know, we don't create something that's too alien that people don't recognize as, um, as Mars. Right. Because I guess, yeah, the idea of Mars being like so deeply, deeply red, it's not hugely deeply red. It's red, but it's not that right. red. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So, so yeah, we had to, to, you know, sit on the fence there a little bit, but uh, at the end of the day, we still had to make it cinematic and add a bit of drama to it. So, so yeah, like, for example, you see, uh, you don't really see clouds on Mars, uh, but we had to add some texture in there because it just wouldn't help us identify things like the horizon, a bit of parallax or a bit of motion in there. So we added subtle sense of clouds in the background. Um, and that was some creative liberty that we had to take. Well, I get, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you can't get to Mars. And so you're still making a a, re a movie. And so it has mm -hmm. to look like something people want to look at, right? And things that That's are familiar right. to us, right? Yeah. So and, adding clouds, know, I think, is, is totally probably, reasonable. Yeah. Probably forgivable as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we still had to keep the ground reality of everything as accurate as, as possible. Um, we also, you know, simulated erosions and reverse engineered landscapes by building a custom scatter system uh, for the rocks uh, based on dust storms or general wind systems so that we could scatter rocks naturally like how it would be scattered with the wind uh, and to match references as well and to faithfully recreate that just so that it didn't look like we were, it was like a set design where we just placed rocks randomly, right? So. We used uh, wind flow systems just to get the rocks scattered across the surface so it looks a little bit more natural. And also these multi-layer erosions uh, that you see on the on the terrain itself, which you can see on the image to the screen left. So um, a wind flow system, like what does mm -hmm. that, like what goes into building that system? Because I'm get, what I understand is that that just generates the rocks or tells you where the rocks should be, but is right. that based on some sort of information that you've given the the system to generate? It is. So some of the tools that we use, which we use even with our other movies that we work on, um, and to just simplify it to a very base level, we have our rocks that we build and then we scatter it by throwing it into the wind, literally, uh, in, in some way, um, where our softwares can then set up airfields where these rocks can then get scattered around. So it just rolls around a little more natural, sits a little more natural on the landscapes themselves. And when you say, you know, throw it in, into the wind, do you, are you modeling like Martian wind atmospheres? Are you using earth wind or is that a and turn of phrase? It, it, it was, it was just a phrase, uh, but also it was funny because um, 
after the screening, we, we were there uh, for the for the first screening. I think the first international screening, and I walked up to Toby Boykins, who's in the um, uh, in the documentary, and and I was like, "So, what, what do you think of it?" And he's like, "Oh, it looks that looked great. That looked really awesome." And I told him some of the stuff that we did, and he was like, "Well, you should have just contacted me. I'd have given you the formula." as to what the wind velocity would have been and you guys could have simulated the whole thing. And I was like, you know, that would have been a bit too much for us. We are still trying to make it look cinematic and that would have gone over our heads. But uh, a lot of it was based on visual references uh, just to make sure that it falls in the similar manner and just has a much more organic um, placement of the rocks. A more organic, yeah, Martian feel. I guess, yeah, if you're feeding it, not wind, at least you're still feeding it Mars information at the very least. So images. At from- the very least, yes, yeah. and. On actually more than the wind, we actually spent proper time looking at Martian light um, because uh, unlike, um, you know, atmospheric conditions on Earth, the light in Mars is different. So we had tons of archival footage and various photographs from NASA's archives that we could actually look at these images and references and uh, make sure that, you know, we get the same nature of light um, based on the sojourn of the sun as it traverses the Martian sky to depict accurate lighting conditions as to what night would look like, what uh, mornings would look like. Um, There are a few shots uh, where we do have a bit of a time lapse where we have our rovers stuck in an infinite, I think it's spirit in an infinite reboot where we see day and night cycles going. So we based a bunch of of the light based on uh, actual um, Martian sky footage. That's a great, uh... Great way to lead into this question I just got from Ian that's asking, what is your partnership like with the team of, at NASA? So like, how was it getting this information and, you know, how much were they willing to give, I guess, is a good question. They were amazing. Uh, we got tons of data. A lot of it was also blurred out, you know, because some of it was stuff that wasn't meant for, you know, people outside NASA to see. Um, but we did get tons and tons of of uh, data from them and they were just super helpful. Uh, Ryan built a nice bridge between um, between us and the, and the and the folks at JPL and NASA. We would send them animations, we would send them our early models of the rovers and they would just come back with notes, you know, talking about how the robotic arm should be bent uh, or, it's, or, or it's traveling too much, the angle of the arm is a little too different. Um, they were excited, to be honest. They just wanted to see what we could do with their rovers from, you know, um, a storytelling point of view. And I guess we were talking a bit before as well that the idea, you know, the teams who worked on the rovers, like it's they're gone, right? They're on Mars. They can't get to them. And so this mm-hmm. film is kind of a way to see like their children again, you know, in a way like it oh, is, it's moving, yeah. it's generating. Yeah. <laughs> they they were just so excited when they started seeing our early animation tests. Um and uh, and and just just renders of Mars itself. Uh, one of the first shots that we did was uh, opportunity being deployed on the Martian surface, where um, you know the the solar panel of the arrays unfold and she wakes up and rolls off the ramp. Uh, and when we did that first shot, everyone was just so excited to look at it, um, and they felt that it looked really authentic to the way it would have happened. That's amazing. I can I can only imagine what that would have felt like, you know, having worked on the project and seeing it happen. Because mm-hmm. when it's happening, you just get the information back. You don't necessarily see what's right. going on. Yeah, um, and we treated it like you know we had like as if there was someone with a camera on Mars just capturing the whole thing. So they were also getting a different perspective and a different point of view on what actually happened there. Right, because a lot of the the images coming back would have just been what the rover would have seen, right? And That's so now right. they get yeah. to see the whole scene of what of what would have happened. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. It's, it sounds like a great partnership and like very beneficial for everybody. At the end of the day. <laughs> it was. It was fun for us. I mean, how often do visual effects artists get to work with you know the geniuses at NASA and JPL? Like you know, at some point, I guess most of us wanted to be an astronaut, right? Uh, so having that connection uh, at some point through your career. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. Very inspiring. That's awesome. I love that. Every At some point, everyone wants to be an astronaut. For me, that ended when I learned how high up I would be going. And then that was done. <laughs> That's okay. Too far. Right. 
Um, what else do you have to, I guess with Martian light, you know, comes with, yes, I was going to ask about this, the landing sequence, speaking of mm -hmm. the atmosphere, right? The atmosphere being 1% of what, of what Earth's is very, very thin. Now you've got this landing sequence, which, uh, or EDL is what they call it, right? Entry, mm -hmm. descent, and landing. And That's this right. became very popular. Um, these seven minutes, so I guess they call it, they had seven minutes, minutes of, terror. of terror with yeah. the curiosity and perseverance really mm -hmm. amplified it with them being completely new ways of landing. But again, they wouldn't have gotten this information. So how did you and your team go about animating this incredibly stressful right. <laughs> sequence of events? I mean, this was where we actually took a bit of uh, creative liberty um, to just keep the viewers engaged, right? Because we have, we did actually get some amount of telemetry data, uh, which we could just use as reference, not really interpret that, but we use that as reference to understand how fast they were traveling, um and you know at the speed or how they were orient uh, how they were orientated uh, while entering the martian surface but we had to make this bit cinematic um just so that you know you you can keep the viewers engaged and get this heighten the sense of tension uh during the sequence um it was a violent stage so you know lots of camera shakes uh, and um the deployment of the parachute as well was treated more like a relief uh right after that initial uh, entry phase, right? So we still kept one eye on realism in terms of like, you know, you see the flutter in the parachutes, um, the uh, when the boosters come out to, to slow the descent down, the dust being picked up, all that is as real as it gets. But in terms of camera angles, in terms of just adding sense of atmosphere that the module is just passing through, because if, if you just imagine a shot as it is, uh, it would actually be quite it wouldn't be as dramatic, right? You, so we had to add little flavors of spice here and there just to make it more interesting. I think that highlights um, a key difference between uh, people who work on, on rovers like this and then people who are watching the results of the rovers like this. Because watching the landing sequence in the film, I was just as stressed, even though I know what happens, mm -hmm. right? Like just knowing the uh, intric in intricacies of what has to happen for the landing sequence to be successful. Whereas, you know, watching it, it's like, oh, the parachute came out. That's good, right? And so you have to really <laughs> yes. make it, like, try to emphasize, you know, how yeah. just how many things have to go right for this to be successful. I do totally. feel like that gets lost in general with launches and landings. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to translate it now to a film with, yeah. you know, in limited information is a very different challenge. Yeah, and music plays such a huge role in the whole thing, right? You know, that definitely heightens the, the, um, the tension in the scene quite a bit. Um, and... Even when you watch uh, Goodnight Opie, you see the camera moves, uh, the camera points of view are a lot more uh, frenetic. Uh, there's a lot more camera shake. Um, there's a lot more quick cuts uh, in the way we see the uh, the modules, modules enter the Martian surface uh, atmosphere. And then once everything deploys and it lands and things settle down, the camera then comes back to a much more stable settled down look so even as a viewer now you've gone away from that frantic nature and now to a much more stabilized uh, point of view of the whole thing so not only are you you know animating the rover and making sure the rover looks emotional enough you're also making sure that the camera shots you're using are making the viewer emotional enough for for the film as well yeah i mean it's all in the framing and composition right because you can turn something that looks fairly simple into something very cinematic and that's what we had to do because we had this massive expanse of landscape, which is nothingness, just dunes and rocks. And we had this one tiny rover traveling through the through the uh, through the landscape. And we had to use creative camera angles uh, by placing rocks in the foreground, by choosing different angles to make the rovers look either heroic or like you know as if they're distressed. So framing and composition plays a pretty big role in the way we portray things on the screen. Great. I guess I, I don't know if you'll talk about it, but my next question, you know, in portraying stressful situations, of course, comes with the ending of opportunity and that mm -hmm. big Martian dust storm. So do you have anything to share right. about that? I don't have images, but I can definitely talk about it. Um, oh, this actually, this slide is perfect. We do have, yeah. yeah, we do have the twisters that turn up, right? The dust devils uh, come up. Um, the the sand the sandstorm, the dust storms was, was fun. It was really fun to do. That's where we could flex our visual effects uh, muscles a little bit because you know we're just creating these massive, massive uh, dust storms that pretty much dwarf um, the rovers. Um, 
And so there was a bit of a debate that happened as to like, you know, do we really see lightning within the sandstorms? Because there were some images that, that showed that we see some, some sort of electrical impulses within the, um, the dust storms, but then there were reports saying that you don't really see them. But we included them anyways, because we felt that just, you know, that it's drama again, right? And we could use those lightning flashes to light up um light light up opportunity as she's staring up into the dust storm with a bit of that fear in there so just almost bringing the horror um nature of storytelling in, into those scenes so the dust storms were super fun to do they definitely obscure everything um in the in this in the scene um and then we also had the dust devils that actually ended up working for the rovers where they they clear up the solar panels and take the dust off them the I'm glad you brought up the lightning because that was my one question when I when I watched the film I was like that's I don't think that's quite right yeah, but I think yeah. they did that for a dramatic reason so I'm glad I, that was confirmed. Um, yeah, no, that was definitely for uh, it, it was for you know we got to give you guys something to point out. Uh, we that's, can't make yeah. everything perfect, right? <laughs> no, yeah, it's for people like me, right? Who are like mm, that's not right. <laughs> but <laughs> it's still fun. It was yeah. still fun. That uh, tied perfectly into Andrew's question, actually, which was uh, how much of the flair from cinematic sci-fi movies did you incorporate into this more realistic documentary? And I guess the answer is where you had to take them, but I don't really see it as flair necessarily. No, we. I think most of it, we just kept it um, on the lines of if we had a camera and we were to shoot the rovers, how would we shoot it? And that's how we treated it. We didn't add anything that was you know, more than necessary. Um, and we just kept, kept it looking beautiful. Um, in some ways, we felt that if you had to pause in a single frame, you should be able to frame that as a photograph. And that's how we approached it. That's a, I think that's a very good approach, especially for a documentary or a film like this. It's a very good approach because it's not mm -hmm. a um, like a flashy sci-fi explosion movie. It's like a story no. of a scientific adventure. Right. Totally. And so you want to keep that that feeling to it. It's very emotional as well. A very emotional scientific adventure. Yeah. And it, and the shots take their time to build. Like every single shot um, goes on for, you know, in some cases, even about 30 seconds. Whereas normally in a visual effects movie, you're just down to a couple of seconds, maybe one or two seconds at the most. So we had to just make sure that um, we kept the viewer engaged through some of those long shots as well. Um, so we had to take that, you know, cinemat cinematography approach to the whole thing and say that, okay, if I had to really shoot these rovers, where would I keep the camera? How would I shoot it? And just bring that realistic nature to it. Now that you mention it, I, yeah, a lot of the seats, like a solid couple minutes of just the rover moving along. Like how long does that take for you to build at, at ILM hmm. in your work? Um, it, it in some ways, I mean, it sounds more like a cop out, but I say it depends uh, because if it's a complex scene in terms of say a bunch of buildings which are with, with a lot more detail in their um, explosions in the background, that's a different approach we'd take for it. Uh, but here we didn't build; um, we treated this as set, right? So we built the stuff around. Victoria Crater around Endeavor, um, the Meridiani Plains. Uh, we built sets of that, and then we could place the rover, then set the camera, and then let let the animation run through it and see how, see how it all worked out. So in some ways, um, it was more of the processing power, the rendering power to get the images out at uh, at a 4K resolution that was a bit of a challenge, and we had to find efficiencies there. But um, in terms of the environment builds, we were building these sets anyways. And uh, we could then place the camera where we felt would work really well for these scenes. Amazing. I guess we're almost to the end. So before we we end out, is there anything else you'd like to share? Maybe your favorite part of working on the project or another <clears throat> one of your slides about some of the work you've done? Well, um, no, I think uh, we, we covered most of it, but I think uh, Goodnight Offie is, is a good example of the intersection of creative and technical minds breathing life into this really inspiring endeavor. Um, the symbiotic relationship that we had with the filmmakers uh, and the scientists um, of, of the Mars mission was pretty much an experience of a lifetime. Uh, it was very inspiring for us. It was great to see their excitement, of, uh, to see their beloved rovers come to life. Um, the filmmakers, Ryan White and his team, formed a wonderful bridge between the visual effects team and the rover teams to bring 
uh, Good Night Opie, which is you know a true labor of love to screen uh, and for all to enjoy and learn from. I think a labor of love is a way to sum up the entire mission, really, with, <clears throat> with spirit and opportunity. You know, uh, especially in opportunities case, a rover only meant to last, you know, a few months, lasting ninety 15, days, yeah. ninety days, yeah, lasting fifteen years, right? That's I think the true labor of love in terms of space science and stuff. Well, I think that's it uh, for questions, and that is our time. So I just want to extend, you know, another thank you to Abby for joining us on Ask an Astronomer. It was a very interesting talk. I'm a big fan of the work that you do over at ILM, and especially this type of project, which is a very, mm -hmm. very unique project. So thank you very much for coming on and discussing the work that you do. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Of course, we would love to have you again for the next fun project you're working on, Absolutely. which you can't tell me about, but I want to know so <laughs> badly. Uh, as for us here at the Space Center, you know, come on by. Uh, we have a couple events coming up uh, here before the uh, end of or coming up in June. So keep an eye out for those. Uh, I will be away for the next, uh, next Ask an Astronomer. So you will have Michael and someone else. I'm not too sure yet, but uh, have a good rest of your day. And thank you again, Abby, for coming and speaking with us. You're very welcome. Thank you.